Okay, you are listening to another episode of Browns Bites, and the Browns have played football, and they played in the Hall of Fame game, and Joe Thomas was in try into the Hall of Fame, and there's a whole bunch of things going on with the team. But the number one question everybody has on their mind is, did Bree's mom bet on the game? <laughs> Actually, I didn't ask if she did. I don't think that she did on Thursday. Listen, almost 7 million people watch this thing. <laughs> that which just screams degenerate gambling to me. So exactly. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if she made her trip down to the little corner store to go uh, get, get some action on it. That's only where she deposits her money, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> There's no betting taking place at the family dollar. Just I just want to make that very clear. But I think it's more entertaining <laughs> if it sounds like there's like some back room she goes into to place bets like at the family dollar. Passing money in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um First things first, obviously, the most important thing that happened was uh, Joe Thomas getting enshrined uh, over the weekend. You know, he's it, he's a charismatic figure anyway, but he's also a very media savvy guy. He's been in the media for a very long time. So he got to deliver a great speech uh, that went over really well. Um, I, you know, I don't know how how much I believe he's. Grateful his mother gra- uh, grounded him for a C plus in algebra, but it sounds really good to say that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was, you know, he's, he's great. He's awesome. You know, he he was good about getting all the people he was supposed to get to. And, and obviously his wife was there in support and his kids and they all, you know, they all look great and they did the things they were supposed to do. So it was just, it was awesome. Uh, and they had a huge crowd, massive crowd for this thing, which was great. Yeah, I had a chance to listen to his speech actually today cuz I'm I told Pete I'm I'm fragmented in everything that happened Thursday on through the weekend, but uh, I thought it was great. I mean, no surprise with Joe being prepared and being very thoughtful in his speech and the fact that he didn't seem like he forgot anyone. <laughs> Everyone that impacted or touched his life at some point during his playing career throughout, you know, being a youngster in junior high all the way up until up until his NFL career. I mean, that was pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, it was full of laughs. It was full of tears. Uh, he had some humor. It was really just a very enjoyable speech to listen to, uh, especially like he was able to poke fun at himself. He was able to poke fun at his quarterbacks that he blocked for uh, the organization a little bit. Obviously, it it went off very well if you were a fan of the Cleveland Browns because he gave a lot of love back to the fan base, being obviously the most loyal. I mean, it's exactly what I expected from Joe. Uh, it was full of all of the feelings that that you would want, and it obviously meant a lot for him to have his family present the award and Annie specifically. Uh, so I thought, it, I thought it was great and I really enjoyed it. And I cried more than once watching it. Uh, I think his best line was probably when he said he blocked for the most quarterbacks in NFL history. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I was interested. I was wondering if they were going to pan to the Haslam's at all, <laughs> you know, throughout that. And they obviously did, but you know, there was jabs there. Yes. Although he made a very, you know, he, he he made up for it. He makes it very clear he's a big fan of them and he's a big yes, fan of yes. what they are as far as the city and obviously where the organization is going. And look, he's still an eternal optimist as far as this team is concerned. Exactly. Uh, he's going to own the team one day, Pete. So he, ha- he has well, to butter them It would be up. interesting if, he, you know, if he's – how close he is to trying to buy a min- um, minority share at this point. But um, – yeah, he said, you know, he believes success is right around the corner. That's sort of that eternal <laughs> optimist. But obviously there is more reason to believe that now than there has been the last several years. So, uh, you know, it's not it doesn't feel blind in that regard, even though in the past you could accuse him of that because this is how he is, uh, which leads us to the game. The Browns obviously beat the Jets uh, 21-16. Uh, the Browns have one more win than every other team in the league. So. Super Bowl, here we go. Uh, <laughs> as I said, 7 million people were around that watched it. And obviously not all of them are Browns fans or Jets fans. But I was excited to watch it, was curious to see how things would go. I, I know a lot of people were focused on individuals or who wasn't playing and all that stuff. But to me, I like the big picture stuff. You saw some concepts inside zone and, and some pin and pull stuff with the running game. They gave them a lot of creativity. And then defensively, 
they did nothing to uh, alleviate my concerns at defensive tackle, but they stopped the run. Like inside running game, they stopped. And their linebackers played really, really well um, in doing that. And like, if not for turnovers, um, the Browns defense would have shut them down pretty consistently throughout the game. Even if you're sitting there going, well, I don't get to see Miles Garrett and Zadarius Smith and JOK and Denzel Ward and all these other things. I do think you get both sides of the ball in that regard. You get a sense for how things sort of operate. That doesn't automatically mean that the Browns are going to be a great run defending team. But I do think you get a sense of the priority that is being placed on them. in the same way that offensively, some of the things they were doing amid amid the 35 screen passes Kellen Mond threw were some things that they have made important to them and suggest that they can be successful at in the season. So I was happy to see some of those things. So on Thursday night, I was at a softball tournament from the hours of five o'clock and I did not get home until I think 830. So I actually missed the entire first quarter, turned it on in the second quarter, and it was like an Aaron Rodgers love fest. So yes, that's that how I started yes. the game. Uh, and I did, obviously, I, I was getting updates, live updates at, that the Browns were scoreless at that point in time. Um, so I actually had to go back and watch the first quarter later. Uh, I didn't want to rewind. I just wanted to kind of pick up where it was and go from there. Um, but yes, I mean, it, at first glance, like the biggest thing was it just felt very flat and vanilla with Kellen Mond. Um Going back and rewatching the first quarter, as you mentioned, lots of screen passes, which is fine. I actually thought the running backs it's throughout the, the entire look, game. I know yeah. it's very easy to make fun of it. And, and there is some truth to the fact that you're trying to, to do that to get avoid having to do some other things. But it's also a really good evaluation tool for your linemen. Your yeah, ability and, to move and, downfield and, and pick up guys in space and that type of stuff. Well, and I feel like, to be fair, I didn't feel like last year our screen game was as strong as we needed it to be for whatever reason. So mm -hmm. I actually was happy that there were a lot of plays that hit and the running backs, I thought, performed really well. The offensive line, I thought, performed really well. There were a lot of lanes opening. Again, like I know that this is very like vanilla from what they were seeing from a defensive perspective. But regardless, I liked what I saw from the offense once DTR got it. <laughs> I thought... Yeah, the don't you don't have to you don't have to pretend like that is 100 the truth i mean like, the it game was got fun when he entered the game yes i mean it was just such a shift in momentum like it just felt like there was a spark i mean he was magnetic he was electric he was all of the verbs not verbs the adjectives to describe however you want to describe him i just really really enjoyed watching him play he mm -hmm. seemed to just have full command he seemed confident he clearly gave it his all he was blocking i mean the block was so funny because that was like what took over the entire internet. Like in true Cleveland Browns fan fashion, that was what people were most excited to see. I think my overall takeaway, and maybe you could enlighten me a little bit more on the defensive side, because I understand this game is mostly played by backups, third mm -hmm. stringers, even fourth stringers in most cases. To me, it felt like the offense, regardless of who was on the field or who they were playing against, we had a lot more talent against the Jets, second string, third string, fourth string. Like, I felt like the offense was just a step above from a talent level who they were playing against. I don't know that I took away that the defense felt like they were evenly matched or better. And maybe it looked better, but in terms of like talent on the field, I felt like our offense had to really pick up the team. And the reason that we won the game was obviously on the offensive shoulder, offensive shoulders versus the defense really being super impactful. But I could be making that entire thing up. Well, let's start with the fact that Kellen was QB4 entering the game. And Kellen started for two reasons. One, so DTR could go in with you know, a, a, li a little bit of an easier path okay. to get his first game in, which makes all the sense in the world. The other reason is because Kellen Mond is auditioning for his next team. Like, you're not going to be here. Maybe he's on the yeah. practice squad, but he's not going to be on the Browns' active roster. And that gave him an opportunity to sort of showcase himself. Okay. So if somebody gets hurt on another team, a de backup or something, maybe somebody's going to come calling. Based on what I saw... I don't think anybody's picking up the phone. He's not bad, but like the interception was brutal. Yeah. It was a different game when DTR was in there. And yes. obviously it was a little bit easier, but DTR is a talented quarterback. Now the other, the other part that DTR has an advantage with is like 
because Dorian Thompson Robinson played at UCLA and the Browns hired Bill Musgrave, who used to coach under Chip, uh, Chip Kelly when he was with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Like, it's a nice little marriage. Those guys fit each other really well. And they're incorporating a lot of those things that Chip Kelly has done to help bring in more spread concepts. So DTR was right at home. This is stuff he's done at UCLA. And the other guy I would point out that looked like he was back at UCLA was Demetric Felton. Uh, yes. obviously back as a running back as opposed to that receiver back thing he was playing, but he looked very comfortable mm-hmm. in that role. The other part that worked out really well is one in terms of screen game, Nick Harris, uh, Luke Whipler, who I loved in that game. Luke Whipler was phenomenal. They're more athletic. They're more nimble. They're better going down the field than, than Ethan Posick is. They just are. So they have a little bit of an advantage of that. But the the, the flip side of that is like, Dewan Jones played every snap, including all yeah. those screens, and like he was good too. In fact, that the the play where people love that DTR block, which is something he did at UCLA uh, quite a bit. He just throws his body around with no regard. On that same play, Dewan Jones is just crushing the right side down as he just <laughs> blows people off the ball because he's so big uh, and powerful. Even with like his massive girth on the field like his presence it is very impressive to watch him because he's really mobile with his feet and Mm -hmm. i guess that makes sense now knowing that he was also a really good basketball player that he he has that type of movement where his size almost doesn't become a factor because his footwork is really good now i know he's still a work in progress and like I got to tone myself down here, but well, I mean, there were a lot of question marks regarding his love of the game and if he was going to put in the work ethic and his conditioning and all of that stuff. So to see him play every single snap, I mean, what a testament to him. And I felt like, I mean, it looked like he belonged on the football field. Well, I mean, if his primary motivation is money, the Browns are going to get the best four years of his life right now because you're not getting very much of it. And he wants to get that big second contract. He's going to have to work for it. and. You know, part of him playing all those snaps was, you know, seeing if he's really in shape and that he's progressed from where he was in the spring, where he wasn't in great shape. He passed that test, obviously. If you just go back to his last year, two years at Ohio State, he gave up like three pressures in two seasons. He was a good run blocker. He doesn't have to get bigger or stronger. He's already 375 pounds or whatever (laughs) he is. He's very strong. I mean, there's clips where you can see him literally do the thing he did at Ohio State where he's got one hand on one guy's chest, another guy on another guy's chest. He's just so big. I mean, I've stood next to Shaq. I've stood next to him. Dewan Jones, to me, is bigger in that regard just because he takes up so much space. And, yeah, he was good. And they got some other players players that were good in that regard. Uh, James Hudson, you know, in his third year, is a very good run defender, a run blocker, still work in progress as, as, a, as a pass protector. Drew Forbes was very good, although, you know, he's an injury guy now, uh, which is terrifying. They they did a nice job for the most part. The Jets had more dudes on the field than the Browns did. They brought the the Jets had their first round pick, the 15th overall pick in the in the game, which the Browns would if they had had first round pick. They had one of their primary pass rushers from last year, Bryce Huff in the game. They had one of their first round picks from last year, Jermaine Johnson in the game, and the Browns were able to block them pretty effectively, especially Dewan Jones. So all those things are good. Uh, the other part that I think helps make the offense look good is Cedric Tillman was impressive. Uh, David Bell continues to look do with the things that I expect David Bell to do. Uh, Dalen Baldwin was effective, though he got hurt. Unfortunately, will be out for a while. Um, and the Browns just have a lot of big bodied receivers. Now, obviously, most people are sitting there Mad at Anthony Schwartz. I've already sort of moved on from that one. I know where that one's going. Yeah, I'm not too worried about I, it. Like, why are we going to continue to kick dirt on him? I, I mean, yeah. at this point, it feels like the writing's on the wall. And again, he was someone that we were excited about because he was fast and we needed a speedy wide receiver, but he has not been reliable. He hasn't been consistent. And I just don't know that he belongs in the NFL, or maybe he does Pete, but like the Cleveland Browns just can't afford to take a chance on him. Like we just don't have the roster spot available to be able to keep him on this roster. I think maybe he could have success in another franchise on another team where they don't need him, but he could be someone that they work on and he might have success elsewhere, but that's just a risk in my opinion that Andrew Barry and his staff, they can't, they can't take. Right. He has Arizona Cardinals or Los Angeles Rams written all over him. Yeah. Uh, teams that 
are where the Browns were several years ago when they went one and 31 and are in a complete rebuild. And that's where those teams are at where they can afford to take that guy. And and look, it was a, it's a, it was a gamble to take him probably took him too early, but ultimately it was a, you know, risk reward type bet didn't pay off, but it's also one of those things that could end up paying off for somebody else. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Schwartz's legacy is going to be that Tampa Bay Buccaneers game last year. He helped them win. Uh, yes. And other than that, he's obviously going to be disappointing. But like the flip side of that is you've got all these other guys that they keep bringing in that are like exciting, like Austin. Uh, is it Austin Watkins. Hawkins Jr.? Austin Watkins Jr. You got me. Uh, is very impressive thus far. Now, I don't know if they've got room on the roster for him. He's another big body receiver. But like I want to I would like to see more of him. Yeah, um, he's a lot of fun and he's sneaky big. He's six, one and a half, 210 pounds or something like that. Um, so like in, in like previous iterations of this team, like that would drag down a lot of, of a lot of fans and we'd sit here just focusing on the fact that the third round picks not working, but the Browns are in a place now where they are constantly bringing in guys that people are excited about, uh, like Watkins or Elijah Moore didn't play in this game, but just in general, people are very excited about Elijah Moore. Um, Cedric Tillman stands out because he's enormous. Uh, yeah, he looks like a dude. Like, you know, you look at the college game, you're like, yeah, he's a big guy, but is it gonna look? Is he gonna look that big in the NFL? He looks that big in the NFL, and he, yeah, little, he little boy to corner, uh, slingshotting him off <laughs> off of him for a curl and had a ton of space to to pick you up yards after the catch. He made two plays that look good because he's able to get open at his size, and it's great. Now the thing is like. What makes me happiest about it isn't that it is that Cedric Tillman looks great and the Browns don't necessarily need him. Like he can be great in preseason and maybe he disappears. Now he could potentially have a, a rookie year, not unlike DPJ or uh, David Bell last year, who had 14 and 24 receptions respectively. But you're not sitting there going, if David Bell or if uh, Cedric Tillman doesn't develop, we're in trouble. Like, right. I'm happy. The same with Dewan Jones. Like, Dewan Jones can crush preseason and maybe he'll be on a few things. I'm sure he'll be on extra point and field goal, but overall you're not sitting there going, if this guy doesn't work out, this team's in trouble. Like that's growth. Uh, that's well, to me, Pete, that is what felt very different about watching this game than maybe in the years past preseason games where again, we were really just trying to hang on to any positive for mm -hmm. these guys to make the team and, not only make the roster, but to also like be impactful members of the team. And so that was just very comforting, at least, like I said, at least from the offensive perspective. I yeah. Still so I feel like I have a lot of questions when it comes to the defense. So defensively, I, I would, I would argue that they, part of the reason they didn't have a ton of impact plays, but they were like solid. They got off the field. So you didn't get a ton of plays. So like a perfect example, Ronnie Hickman had one tackle in the whole game, but like, and you're sitting there going, well, did Ronnie Hickman really do anything? And then I like I go back and watch it again. It's like they didn't do anything like offensively. It wasn't like a situation where he had to like bubble bold. And I think was the most impactful safety in the game. He had a couple of hits and made the interception. But like, again, the Jets did not move the ball other than when Kellen Mond turned it over or Anthony Schwartz turned it over. That was 10 of their points and they scored 16. Yeah, I, I know because they didn't score again in the second half. Right. So like. You sit there and go, well, did the defense really do much? And there are certainly things you can criticize. Like they stopped the run. No one got close to the quarterback the entire game. The, the pass rush was non-existent. And that stuff scared me because I'm sitting here looking at Jordan Elliott and go, Maurice Terrace going, you guys want to do something? Yeah. Uh, um, and I get it. Like Alex Wright, that's not really what he does. Isaiah McGuire, not necessarily what he does right this moment. They were doing the stuff they need to do, but at the same time, you're sitting there going, uh, I'd like to see more out of this group. So like Siaki Ika, I would say had a pretty marginal average game, except that on that one uh, third and one play, he did exactly what the Browns signed up for with him. And he took on the double team and stopped the run and got them off the field. Uh, or that may have been the play that set up the, fourth and three pass breakup by uh, Greg Newsom's buddy, uh, Cameron Mitchell, which was a phenomenal play. That was like really, really good. They tried to go short, uh, quick pass and and he was able to beat the receiver to it and knock it away. Like, so 
I think in part, like not having super flat, flashy plays other than like when Charlie Thomas the third cut the dude in half as a linebacker and, and knocked the ball out, which went right out of bounds. Like you didn't get those super impact plays. So in some ways it felt rather sort of ordinary. But again, I would point to Tony Fields and and uh, and uh, Jordan Kunashik, which I thought were really, really good in that game. They, they, they were both probably had a tackle they could have made that they missed. But overall, like they were aggressive, they were downhill, they were able to fill right where they needed to go, and that helped to shut down the run. Other than like the one run where they managed to uh, break contain, get outside of Isaiah McGuire with uh, Prince Abanaconda, who I really liked coming out of college, out of Pitt, they got that one play. But other than that, it was like two point three yards per carry. Like I get it, not not flashy stuff. There, certainly you're sitting there hoping you, you get more more looks of those guys, but they just didn't have very many plays. I mean, really, their whole game was – their biggest play was Zach Wilson's one major completion. Like, that and the touchdown, is there any play that really stands out to you that the Jets made on the Browns' defense? No, and I guess that's also fair, too, but I don't know. I guess maybe it's something that I just need to get used to, or – this is just a matter of preseason. And so there's there's just a lot left that we're not necessarily going to see at this point in time. So let's not jump to conclusions. Uh, I, I just, when I look at like talent that's on the field though, at the same time, I guess what I'm measuring is, do they look better than the offense that's on the field when you match them up? And I, I don't know. Again, like, I guess we'll go to this Friday and have another chance to to look at that. So I, I think it's both. I think it's both those things. I think preseason's a factor. Ab- absolutely. I don't think offenses are doing a ton of di- things to try to screw them up, and they can play largely base base defense and, and do what they do. But at the same time, like, I, I, don't, I don't think the Jets' offense is very good either. <laughs> so – with those backups, like I don't think those guys are particularly good. Like I like, I like uh, uh, Abanaconda, but I, there aren't a lot of guys on that Jets offense where I'm going, "Wow, I wish we got him." So I think, I, I, I think you're you have a good reason to sort of be a little hesitant with praise, just because I, I think other than their frontline guys, the Jets are largely a a very defensive team in general. So it's like, let's not get nuts that that the the, the uh, Browns shut down Chris Strevler. A quarterback, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, no, I, t- I totally get it. Um, but, uh, you know, and then part of it's also the, the, the Browns um, invest more in general offensively. Are the top picks, obviously, Siaki Ika was in the third round, but like you're sitting there going, their top pick was still wide receiver in Cedric Tillman. Uh, their fourth round pick, Dewan Jones, they had a uh, fourth round pick on defense and Isaiah McGuire, but like, Cedric Tillman and Dewan Jones were like our guys that are pretty they they are ready to go. Uh Cedric Tillman's 23 years old. He should be, you know, physically mature. Now Dewan Jones just happens to be a freak show um in that regard. And then like again, Luke Whipler going getting a chance to watch his tape after the Browns drafted him. I was amazed that he was available when he was. I get it. I could see it on tape. There are some times where he gets jostled because he does need to improve his trunk strength and certain things, but he's very smart. And he's very athletic and he just plays super hard. He's constantly uh, driving his feet to the whistle and all those. He's just pain in the ass, which is what you want at that position, which uh, was great to watch. Like him and Dewan Jones were really entertaining in that regard. So uh, you're right in that. Let's see what happens with Washington. Now, again, it doesn't help. No one's going to accuse the Washington commanders of having a, you know, a dynamic offense either. So it may take a minute and, and really, the test is going to come and we won't get like a, you know, a real view of it, but like it's going to be those joint practices with the Eagles. Like that's the big test right. for, for this group. And, and, you know, we'll get bits and pieces and sort of a sense of it, but we're not going to get like tape we can watch and, and, and go, Oh man, they look pretty good. So the question is going to be but, to, but see, to that point. I feel like the joint practices have been, if you go back in hindsight, the previous years, even under the Freddie kitchens regime, I believe there were some warning signs coming out of that camp just in regards to how far away the Browns felt oh. in terms of matching. Were they were they joint practicing with was it the Giants or was it the Bills? Just when? In the Freddie Kitchens. 
Uh, Wasn't there like the I big fight? I can't. Whatever. I know they, it doesn't I know, matter. Oh, yeah, regardless. I, mean, I, know, I know they they had the Eagles again last year, but before that, I have no idea. Yeah. Regardless, I feel like that's that that truly is like the measuring stick of, you know, how do we look against another team, starters to starters, and those guys versus. I, I understand the importance of preseason because you have guys that need to make the roster and who are auditioning and and whatnot. And like, they're really important too, from a depth perspective, but yeah, I really want to understand it, it when we get to that point, how do, how do we look? How are things yeah. going? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and it'll be curious. Uh, uh, it'd be interesting to see, do the Browns play their starters against Washington because they're probably not going to play their starters against the Eagles by virtue of having, having done the, the joint practice. That will be their The starters getting reps. Uh, right. They're not going to do. They're probably not going to waste their time with that, and then they're not going to waste their time with the starters in that last game. So, if we see starters, it may be this week. It may be that they they go ahead and do a little bit this week. I don't love that idea, but <sighs> I get it. So we may get a little taste of the first team and 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 some things uh, this week against Washington. Which certainly you're really excited about it until somebody goes down, regardless of what team they're on, and you're like, all right, cancel the game. We're good. That's always yeah. the reaction to injuries. So, you know, we'll see how they go with that. But speaking of injuries, that's that, that's the big thing is, unfortunately, um, the preseason game itself, uh, Dalen Baldwin really uh, hurt his hamstring. He's going to be out for a while. The Browns would like to get him back. But, like, he's this plucky little, you know, plucky receiver, another guy with size, caught a couple balls against the Ravens last year, just did some good things and got hurt in that game. You know, that potentially opens up a roster spot, maybe for a guy like Austin Watkins. If they can get him to the practice squad, they will happily do that. But um, the other kid I, I thought did well was uh, Grieve Greeny, the tight end from Albany. Uh, he's interesting. I think he's a guy they would like to get the practice squad so they can get him a little stronger. But he, he's doing a nice job getting open and catching some passes. Other injuries, most of them happened at practice after the game. Uh Drew Forbes carved off of the back. He looked really good in the preseason game. And now they've got a real question at, at one of those backup guard spots. I, you know, severity, no idea. But anytime you hear the word back and card, uh, it does not leave me with a, a ton of hope. Alex Wright and uh, Isaiah Thomas, both knees that had surgery today. We're recording this on Tuesday. Had surgery today. They're going to miss some portion of the season. It's a question of how much they. Kevin Stavinsky thinks they will be back, uh, but it may be IR at the start of the season and then, you know, move on from there. Um, so that presses the d- defensive end depth, which means Lonnie Phillips is back in my back in my back at a chance to make the roster. Uh, I enjoyed watching him in preseason because all he does is play with his hair on fire and fly around. Even on punt coverage, he was the first one down there at 244 pounds. And then uh, Jerome Ford, hamstring. They're calling it day to day. Not really what you want to hear, especially uh, since. Well, I mean, this is one of those things where, like, when you can't see practice, you can only go on what you what you see. And to this point, for Jerome Ford as a running back, I've seen eight carries for twelve yards. So they're putting a lot of faith on him, in him to say he's going to be able to do these things. And skill set wise, I get it. He's it's, he's got size for the position. He's got a, a really good catching the ball in the backfield. Things that will be very valuable, especially this the way this offense is going to be operating. So he could have a a big role. Um, I feel like the combination of John Kelly Jr., uh, Demetri Felton, and Hassan Hall has sort of allowed the Browns to be a little more patient coming out of the preseason game because they all ran well. Um, and maybe the Browns are at a point where insert back can can gain yards in this offense, which they've done reasonably successfully in the past, but obviously not. you don't want to live doing that. But at least right now, I, I think it allows them to sort of be, be patient as far as trying to pursue free agent. It may be a they've got their price at a certain point, and unless the a veterans willing to come down to it, they're not going to move. If, if they don't feel good about those guys, maybe they move up a little bit. But I think, you know, we'll see how long Ford is out. And then uh, the biggest one uh, is Greg Newsom with a groin injury. He's listed day to day. All the reporting has said that they're confident he will be back for game one. So take that for what it's worth as far as how day to day he is. It's not all bad news. Uh, the good news is that Jakeem Grant, kick returner slash receiver, 
was back in team drills. That's super positive for him. He worked he worked his ass off um, recovering from the Achilles last year. And both Anthony Walker Jr. and Sione Takitaki are in team drills at this point, which is huge because, you know, those are two frontline guys at that linebacker position. So, you know, other than doing like walkthrough and individual drills, they have that's that's been it for them. And then it's been all JOK and these other guys who have been playing that position. So I would not expect either of them to participate in this week's preseason game. Maybe they do at some point, but uh, we'll see. It, maybe they'll be in like the, the last one for a little bit just to sort of get them out there. But I think for the most part, they're going to just sort of just be focused on the season and not worry about the getting uh, the exhibition reps. Yeah, I, of course. You know, you're always fearful as a fan through this time of year. Like we all just sit here like nervous about the injuries and notable ones coming out of today, especially in in positions that it felt like depth was already in question a little bit. I, I more so on the defensive um tackle slash defensive end side. Like those to me were like two big blows. However, like again, I've still feel like there were question marks that position specifically um running back I'm not really worried about like I felt like we saw enough um out of the guys that played on Thursday to really be a suitable option um to back up Nick Chubb I mean and knowing what we got out of Kareem Hunt last year was to have left a lot to be desired I feel like we'd be able to utilize some of those guys that played on Thursday again to have some additional depth there um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is what happens and there's, there's no way to control it. This is why I feel like Friday, there's a lot of questions as to who's playing and who's not, because you can't control any of this, Pete. You just gotta roll with the punches. Well, that's the thing. Uh, I'm on the camp of, I don't care what the fans want. Just do what's best for your football team. If you genuinely think it's good for your football team to get reps, so be it. But ultimately, you know, I, I'm not a big proponent of preseason. I don't care about you know, getting out there for a couple series or if it's a whole quarter or whatever, to me, that just puts your team in peril. And I, <laughs> yeah, because and you're, you're usually in a controlled setting in your practices. Like, I know an injury can happen anywhere. They happen at practice. Obviously, that's that's what we uh-huh. saw. However, you are in control of what is happening at practice. Like, which like, is why, which is why teams love joint practices. Yeah. Because they can go quick whistle. They can do drills in a way that it's not, it, it's not allowing guys to just get whacked out of nowhere there's not a whole bunch of guys running around so like there are ways to control it now the 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 downside of the joint practice is the the uh penaltyless brawl that comes with it yes exactly if you get in a brawl in a game the nfl is going to come in and potentially at the very least fine you and potentially suspend you if you get a brawl at one of these uh, at one of these um joint practices the nfl has no governing power which is why famously Aaron Donald swinging multiple Bengals helmets at the same yes, time. Yes, I forgot Bengals about penalty. that. So yeah, the, like that. It's 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 a very hilarious double standard in how that works. Everybody clearly sees Aaron Donald with two helmets swinging at guys, and nothing is done about it. Whereas Miles Garrett, you know, all those games for that, it's just it's just a fiasco because it was on national television. As exactly, to grainy grainy training camp footage. Tra- um, <laughs> footage from a reporter. Yes, so. Yeah, the, the 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 that element is is certainly valuable. Now the 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 uh, coaches hate hate to have the brawls break out because they know they can't do anything. But they will, at the, you know, if it's if it gets bad enough, they will just cancel practice, cancel it at that point, and then there can be some real uh, penalties in that regard. Uh, like you know, former Ohio State uh, tackle Jamarco Jones got cut from the Titans for being in three fights in one day or some some crap. <laughs> chippiness for the sake of you know not being pushed around and stuff coaches will respect that coaches understand that but when you were just likes to fight guy to the to the nth degree where you're just looking to brawl anyone now you're one in this case it's not the it's not jamoker jones you're worried about it's what you know if he actually does some damage to one of your other guys um that that you care about then it's a huge problem and it's just a waste of time and energy and practice time so yeah, you end up in that element and you just don't want to deal with it. But um, so I'll be curious to see how Kevin Stefanski bang- balances it. I never get a sense that he's always that he's worried about the fans in that regard in terms of what he's willing to show them. I think he does have uh, a good sense of what he wants to accomplish. I, I feel like 
again, he's in year four. I, I, always, I, I always have a feeling, a good feeling about hit, hit, how he's organized things, which is why I really liked how he handled the Greenbrier thing, which is where we were pretty injury free to get ramped up for the season as opposed to trying to beat their brains in. Now, there's certainly merit to that. I know the Steelers are constantly banging and all that stuff, but we'll ultimately see who's prepared for the season and and who's going to be healthiest and, and, and all that stuff that matters. The last thing, Cade York. Oh, yeah. How he, could we forget? <laughs> he, push, he pushes a 49-yard field goal. Suddenly, people have lost their minds o- over this. I have not heard one person talk about Cade York the entire offseason, which I was happy about. And the second he misses it, <laughs> cut him, sign a new guy. We're moving on. This is a Whoa. fan base and media that has a track record of wanting rid of Zane Gonzalez, who made, I believe, all pro. Wanting rid of Chase McLaughlin, who like crushed it for the Colts last year. And everybody just loves Phil Dawson, who sucked for three years when, when the team didn't matter. We just don't have a lot of patience yes. just in general. Um, and again, like, let's just level set for a minute. It was a 49 year old field goal. Yes. 49. Yeah. I mean, understood that as of recent years in the NFL, you see kicks of that length being made, but I would say that's still a really difficult kick to make in the NFL for Cade. I feel for him because There were multiple times last year where he missed kicks and field goals that mattered. I mean, they were, they were, there's little room for margin of error on this Cleveland Browns team because unfortunately for us, we don't have, we didn't have, you want to use past tense here because we don't know what this season's going to hold, but our defense was at times challenging and our offense at times was also in a stallmate. So those kicks made a huge difference between winning and losing. And I think that's what's top of mind for a lot of fans right now is, do we want to, again, go into this season with this risk of, if the difference of a game is a field goal, can we really rely on Cade York to make the field goal? I do have to say, Pete, I had to turn off Sports Talk Radio on Friday when I heard someone call in to Ken and Anthony's show and propose that we trade Nick Chubb for Justin Tucker. Well, that is a that is a PFF argument right now, or, or has been the last couple of weeks, which is basically saying, and this is got, uh, maybe it's not PFF, but it certainly has been out there as sort of this debate thing. Would you rather have the best running back in the league or the best kicker in the league? Or like, as of if those are equivalent values, I'm I'm obviously gonna go with the running back. I like I get I get how good Justin Tucker is, but no, oh, I don't care. I yeah, mean, I mean the, the the reality for us is, as Browns fans, we want to be scoring more touchdowns than anything this year. I yes. don't want to have to rely on field goals just in general. So can we just level set there for a minute? And I understand not every extra point is automatic for Cade. That, that, that much has been proven over the last year. But, like, let's focus on scoring touchdowns. Like, let's not just say that we're okay with field goals and that we need to rely on our field goal kicker to be the difference in the game. Like, that's that's problem number one, if that is our mindset. Right. So there's a lot there. Um, and I also listened to the first hour of Ken Carmen and Anthony Lima as I was driving into practice uh, on Friday. And 80% of that hour was focused on Cade York. Um and one of the points made was just go out and sign somebody. Well, here's what I remember. When the free agency was about to start two years ago, it was sign the Falcons kicker, who then got a $25 million contract. And then one of the comparisons made on the show was, well, Greg Greg Zerline is only making $2.75 million, which is $1.75 million more than Cade York is making. Like That's one of the biggest benefits to having Cade York. He costs nothing. Like that was a huge point because the Browns don't want to spend money on that. They want to spend uh, money on everything else to bolster this roster as much as possible. And that's Greg Zerline taking a pay cut because he was released by the previous team because he was making too much money. And yes, he's perfectly confident. He made, he made some big long kicks. But here's the thing. The Jets kicked three field goals. The Browns scored three touchdowns. Who exactly. won the game? The that's Browns the difference. Score touchdowns. And in preseason, I really don't care because I'm sitting there annoyed at the fact and I understand why you do it, and I still hate it. As they, it's fourth and two, and you go punt because you want to get a punt rep. Just go for it. 
all these situations were like, let's kick the field goal. No, go for it. Go for it. Go for two. I hate this stuff. All I want for my kicker beyond kickoffs is to kick end of half, end of game scenarios. That's it. Like, other than that, I want to go for it because that's exactly my mindset. People spend more time thinking about kicking than I have in my 14 year coaching career in high school about our kickers. Like, I don't care. I never go into a game thinking, well, man, I hope we should kick a field goal. No, we go in with the plan up. <laughs> we're going to try to score touchdowns and try to score as many touchdowns as possible. We don't sit there and go, well, I hope we can score 24 points. And one of those is a field goal. We we talk in terms of scoring, scoring touchdowns and, you know, extra point or going for two. And we're more than happy to go for two. I hate the mindset of like, don't let allow yourself to be in a position where the kicker is going to make your, your difference. Certainly Justin Tucker is a super valuable weapon, but like, most of the kick, most of the teams you think are really good, you don't know who their kicker is this year. Exactly. Sure, you probably remember Adam Vinatieri. Maybe you know Stephen Gostowski from when he was with the Patriots. But like Matt Gay from the Rams, are you sitting there? How many people knew who that was? Matt Gay that was on the Rams when they had their run, or or the the Bengals kicker. I, I like to me, I just work it out, figure it out. You don't treat these guys really like relief pitchers and keep just. Uh, going through and going through until you find a hot kicker because the Browns never find that guy. Exactly. And then we end up getting journeyman after journeyman after journeyman. And like I said, they cost money. Uh, you don't want to mess around with it. Let them do it. One of the big reasons Bubba Ventron was hired here, and one of the thing, first things he said was, K. Dork was my top rated kicker that year. I thought he was phenomenal talent. So let him figure it out. And that's not even considering the possibility that it's uh, the holder – uh, which has historically been an issue with Corey Bohorquez going back. And I'm not blaming him for what happened. I'm just saying that that has been a trend that people don't believe he's a very good holder and that could be a major impact. But overall, I don't care. I'm never going to sit here and go, well, the Browns would have been good if they had a good kicker. The Browns would have been good if they had a great offense with a good quarterback or a great defense. Like that is ultimately what's going to win. If you're sitting there crying about the kicker, like going into the season on the list of things that I'm worried about kickers near the bottom below that punter below that long snapper. I'm not, these things are not a big concern to me. I'm worried about uh, scoring touchdowns on offense and keeping the other team out of the end zone. You do those two yes. things. You're going to win football games. The rest, I don't care. I could not agree more. And we know that Kevin Stefanski is already aggressive when it comes to his play calling and going for it on fourth down. So this is why I also think it's probably not as big of a concern when they think about game planning and this season because they feel so confident in their offense and Deshaun Watson specifically that they're hopefully not going to be in this situation where field goals are going to be making or breaking their games this year. I mean, again, we'll see how this plays out. Like, let's hope that it doesn't bite us in the butt. But yeah, like, let's focus on scoring touchdowns and and doing that and keeping our opponents off the field and not giving up chunk plays. Like those were bigger issues. And all of this was over one missed field goal in a, in an exhibition game for 49 yards. It's not like he went up winning by the way, like it's, they won. It it didn't matter. Like at the end of the day, that's the other part of it that just, it was was never, it was, it was like, we've got to do something about Cade York. By the way, DTR was pretty good. It like, (laughs) you know, that's that, that mindset just, Priorities are not in the right look, that's, spot. Hey, look, that's why, you know, that's why we're not in the business of radio because maybe you have to do those things to get maybe some of those maybe some of those callers are listening to this and think thinking you want to call in and yell about Kate York. That's fine. I'm not interested. Um but yeah, ultimately Bubba Ventrone's there to, to coach him up and fix it. I'm worried about what he makes what what happens in the season. I'm worried about what happens when uh when uh, he has to make the kick like he did against Carolina and makes the game-winning kick, like those are situations where you need to make a kick. Did he miss some of those last year? Yes. Did it really matter in the end? Not really, because it was still a Jacoby Brissett-led offense that wasn't going to take us to playoffs. This year, obviously, there's more to it, but this is why you have the people in charge. And to this point, the Browns have shown no interest in trying anybody else out, which is fine with me. Just figure this one out, coach him up, and work with him like you do anyone else. I- I'm not interested in the voodoo of you know people like talking about well he, he must he must not have the mentality to kick as if that's if that's the whole point um just accept that you don't know i and i and i, I coach the sport and i don't know enough about kicking to tell you how it goes so uh stop psychoanalyzing and just move on and let them figure it out uh if it's 
if it's a, an issue well into the, you know into the season, then they can move on to somebody else. But I don't care right now. I'm worried about every other position on this team, specifically things like defensive tackle. I'm worried about things like running back. I'm not worried about kicker. So with that, so Browns play Washington on Friday. It's going very fast at this point. Preseason, everything else, um, it's going to fly by, and we're going to be into the season before you know it, which is great in some ways, and you know, sort sort of feels very rushed in other ways. But uh, I'm excited to see what they do. I'm gonna continue to watch some of these guys that I'm excited about seeing these uh, some of these undrafted rookies, some of the rookies they have, some of these second year players that are going, and and we'll see what happens with the starters. But overall, I would say. Save for the injury part, which is always unfortunate. The Browns had a successful Hall of Fame week, which is all that we can really ask for at this point. Joe Thomas gets in. Awesome. Browns win the game. Awesome. We'll ignore all the stuff that happened with the stadium and 77, which was not a great look for the state of Ohio. But we made it through it, and we'll move on to the next one. Next one's Friday. We'll be back next week to talk about that one and see where we are from that point. Hopefully, we're not talking about having to do this again with the kicker. 